Notes 22, page 68. And we're, um, we've been developing paraxial wave equations, which we're going to eventually finite difference and use um, a physical domain um, solution for our downward continuation instead of every, everything in the Fourier domain. This will allow us to take care of um, a more variety of velocity. Um, but uh, of course, I want to um, I want to start with the uh, the simplest uh, possible solutions. So uh, we're going to keep on to um, a vertically stratified medium with velocities of function of, of depth only, uh, and um, uh, but our our velocity uh, has no vari variation in x, and of course we're still in two D, so there's no variation in y either. Now, um, this is a separate method of developing the paraxial wave equation. Um, instead of uh, by essentially inverse transforming from some version of the dispersion relation, which is what we're going to use, okay, that's what we covered last time, we're going to develop the paraxial wave equation from the ray parameter or slowness p. Uh, now, this is a very uh, useful uh, exercise. Uh, theoretically, because p is something you can measure right on your 2D data set. You know, your, your uh, zero offset data set has axes x and t, and you measure the slope of a, of a reflection, you know, or a diffraction or anything in there, and you've got a direct, you know, measurement of, of the ray parameter p. So, uh, you know, other things like velocity, like the angle of propagation, that all has to be interpreted. But p is a measurement. So uh, you would think that it would be very useful. Uh, sad to say, we don't have time to go through this. And so I'm, going to, um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, uh, pick through this and, and give you uh, a couple of the uh, highlights uh, about the ray parameter p that I think are important to remember for later. So. Um, um, I think this uh, relationship that's double underlined here is a is is an important reminder about what it is. You know, it's it's this directly measured um, uh, dt dx. You know, which you can get right off your data. Okay, um, and uh, uh, that's uh, you know that's uh, one reason why uh, we uh, we would want to use it. And it's it's basically our basic data. It's essentially our basic data set. Uh, in all of you know migration and all of our analyses of uh, zero offset data. In fact, even when we go to multi offset data and non zero offset, um, we're still going to use that ray parameter pretty frequently. Uh, so um, uh, and then here's some more just as a reminder. Here's some more definitions of the ray parameter. dt dx is sine theta over v, um, and then also there's a uh, you know p is really the the inverse of the horizontal component of the apparent velocity. It's the horizontal apparent velocity. There's also a vertical uh, slowness, dt dz, you know, going down into the uh, uh, into the section, which is the cosine of the uh, that slope is the cosine of the propagation angle theta over v, and it also has this relationship with the horizontal p. Okay. So uh, we can develop a uh, uh, the form of a of a Snell wave from that, and uh, we can write a five degree paraxial wave equation, and then uh, we can modify it by putting in uh, the this uh, relationship with uh, uh, with the ray parameter p. Okay, and what we uh, what we end up with is um, is this. Uh, uh, expression uh, this paraxial wave equation, which is um, and, and I had made a mistake in the original notes, um, and that's that's p right there. Okay, and this capital P here and here, that's really um, the uh, that's the wave field, right? Capital P is the wave field. Small p is the slowness, which is dt dx, and so there's p squared basically uh, in the middle here. And there's one over v squared, 
Okay, and here we're explicitly handling velocities as a function of depth. Uh, and this is the the slope, right? The 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 uh, the difference in the wave field with depth that we need for downward continuation. So, uh, and you can see it depends uh, through this radical here uh, on the um, on the time evolution of the wave field, which is kind of what we what we want. Okay, and um, uh, you might ask the question, and this becomes a uh, a way that we'll handle a lot of things. You know, we we okay. This uh, this expression works with one p, one ray parameter. Okay, but our wave fields contain a lot of different values of the ray parameter p. You know, our actual propagating waves have many different values of p. So we can we can uh, deal with it in the Fourier domain, right? And if you recall, the Fourier duals, the the time derivative uh, has a Fourier dual with uh, minus i omega. The x derivative has a Fourier dual with minus i k x. Okay, then dt over dx has a Fourier dual with kx over omega, which means that that's the ray parameter, you know, having a Fourier dual with kx over omega. We can just, you know, as I had done here originally, we can write it as a uh, as an equals and make a substitution, and any any uh, any uh, uh, equation that uh, that contains the ray parameter, we can put in the Fourier domain just by substituting kx over omega for the ray parameter. And th thus we can handle it in the Fourier domain. Okay, so um, uh, you know then we can uh, we can s make this uh, downward continuation in uh, in this form, and the the it's it's very much like what you've seen before, except that uh, the um, uh, there's this integration inside the uh, you know instead of just directly getting dz, uh, I'm sorry, k sub z. Okay, we uh, we have to integrate to get k sub z because you know we have a lot of we have different values of velocity at different depths. So this is something that's a a, a utility that we'll see uh, a little bit later, but it still has uh, you know about as as uh, simple a solution as as uh, uh, the uh, the the uh, solutions we've looked at before, but nobody uses it. Okay, and I, I will I will show you what people really do use uh, in a little bit. I do want to step back and uh, talk about some of the motivation as to why we're doing extra wave extrapolation now in the physical domain. Why are we developing um, paraxial wave equations in, in the T and X domain that we're going to finite difference? Why are we doing that when we had um, uh, you know, perfectly good um, extrapolation in the Fourier domain? OK. So, um, so let me uh, let me go through some a little bit of review here. It's not a bad time to step back and and review a little bit. All right, we have uh, surface data, which uh, in the way I presented it is on the the front of a volume. So this is uh, a wave field, a zero offset survey that is recorded in time and uh, x distance uh, at z equals zero. We do a downward continuation and we expand that uh, to a volume. At different values of z, which is now pointing back into the screen. Okay, uh, and then we do imaging. Okay, we say we apply our imaging condition, and that means extracting just the top of this wave field. Okay, the downward continued wave field. Right, we we create the top there. That's at zero time, and uh, and that we're going to draw an equivalence with the reflectivity section. Okay. So uh, and we can ex we can express the uh, the downward continuation as a multiplication in the omega and kx domain. Okay. So uh, here's the surface data p of t z equals zero and x. We're going to downward continue to p of t and x and a uh, a particular value of z, and we're going to do that by multiplying the original data by this in the Fourier domain by e to the uh, uh, the power of i times z times k sub z. Okay, and k sub z is equal to plus or minus the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. All right, so all this has been derived from the scalar acoustic wave equation. With now we know the assumption that density is constant everywhere in time and space. Now this situation is analogous to a 1D filter. Okay, we have an input uh, 
uh, and we've, we've, worked, we've worked with those earlier in the semester. We have an input uh, uh, seismic trace uh, I of t. Uh, we convolve it with a filter time series uh, through a filter, and we have an output O of t. All right, and there's the uh, convolution. In the time domain, that uh, convolution is uh, represented as uh, an integral. Okay, and uh, you know there's a certain amount that gets us the uh, uh, the output at one time, right? So one application of the integral gets us the output at one time, and we got to do the integral again if we if we want uh, if we want the output at a different time. And actually, this t here is a is a lag. I should have switched that. You know, you go from zero to t on the integral, and you have uh, instead of uh, uh, instead of t, I would I, everywhere I, I have t, I would I would put tau as the lag, and every and here where I have tau, I would put t instead. But anyway, uh, that's just uh, notation. In the frequency domain, okay, this uh, convolution is simpler. It's just you know frequency by frequency, we multiply the Fourier transform of the input by the Fourier transform of the filter, and that gives us the Fourier transform of the output. All right. Now uh, our omega and kx domain wave extrapolation, you know, as used in the GASDAG, um, in the GASDAG uh, phase shift migration or in Stoltz uh, migration, it's just multiplying in the Fourier domain along two axes rather than one. Okay, and so uh, maybe uh, you know it's a filter, uh, uh, you know, that that works on a on an image in the well, not an image, but a uh, a two D uh, Fourier transform data set. Uh, so we'll also try to get used to the concept that we can uh, convolve along two axes rather than just one. Okay, and we're going to see how to implement that in the time domain. And our our method, our our you know the actual mechanics of it is going to be using finite difference paraxial wave equations. So just as convolution in the time domain is a is a recursive feedback process, and you've seen the, the recursion. You know, so are finite difference solutions. All right. You know, the the output at uh, at one level is dependent on the on the uh, output at the previous level. And the same thing uh, can be done with convolution. So we'll be able to extrapolate in either domain along any particular axis. So we'll we'll eventually see a uh, a migration that works completely in the physical and time in the physical domain x z and t. Uh, we've already looked at migrations that work completely in the Fourier domain, uh, uh, like Stolt omega k z and k x. The Gazdag um, uh, phase shift migration works in the omega z and k x domain. Okay, we could come up with a migration that works in the time domain. But in KZ and in the X domain, okay, all this all this is possible. It's just it's just algebra, and you know we could either have a finite difference two uh, D convolute or finite difference convolution along some axis, or we can do it in the Fourier domain with a multiplication. Okay, so given that we can we can you know do any component of our extrapolation in the physical or the Fourier domain. What are the uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of um, of this? Okay, of each domain. So anything you do in the Fourier domain, you know, you multiply in the Fourier domain, and uh, if there's a, an error or a spike in the in the data, okay, or a problem with interpolation, that error gets spread over the uh, uh, over the whole result, right? Because it might be at one particular frequency, but after you inverse Fourier transform it, you know that that error at one particular frequency or wave number is going to be seen throughout the whole data set or throughout the whole result. Whereas you know doing it with finite differences or convolution in the in the physical domain, any errors you know they their effects kind of stay local. If there's an error on one particular trace, you'll see it you know basically near that trace. So there's error isolation is is sometimes useful, sometimes it's not. Um, you know there are cases I can think of where um, you know there there's a, an error and it's actually helpful to spread it around globally. Okay, 
it doesn't interfere too much as long as it's spread out. But when you when you when it affects uh, just the you know locally, it becomes a real eyesore. Uh, so there's there's that problem. Um, okay, Fourier domain. Uh, I think you you uh, hopefully you've gotten the idea that that it's really easy to implement you know say Stolt migration uh, or Gazdag migration with um, in the Fourier domain. All right, it's uh, it, it's uh, uh, just a few loops. Okay, it's easy to uh, you know once you have the the fast two uh, D fast Fourier transform at your disposal, just a few calls, just a few loops. All right, the physical domain uh, migration is easy to derive. Okay, it, it's more it it makes more sense physically. All right, because you're not in the frequency and wave number domain. Okay. Uh, it, so it's easy to derive, but it's the, here the implementation is what's really hard, and that's you know the implementation is what you're going to struggle through in labs uh, uh, seven and eight, okay, uh, and maybe nine if we get to that. Although I'm wondering, maybe we won't. Um, the Fourier domain is uh, uh, solutions are fast because of the fast Fourier transform. Um, but but everything kind of happens in a black box of that fast Fourier transform, okay? Uh, in the physical domain, uh, you can watch the computation happen. You can look at every depth step or every every time step, and you can watch it happen. There there are advantages to that when you're developing something. You can see exactly why it's blowing up, okay? Uh, the Fourier domain uh, leads to wraparound artifacts. And 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 that's what controls the cost of computation, okay? Uh, what controls the cost of computation in the physical domain with finite difference is dispersion artifacts. Basically, you have to sample finely enough uh, to be able to calculate. Uh, you know, finite differences are estimating derivatives uh, with your discretized data, with your discrete data, and so you know they're just estimates of the of the derivatives and not. Um, uh, and not, uh, uh, and they can be they can be off, and so that can lead to dispersion artifacts. You know, in the Fourier domain, we have to we have to uh, uh, use zero padding, right? We got to for our fast Fourier transform, we got to pad our data out to the uh, the next power of two in length, in, in both directions. Okay, and that that adds the cost of computation. Uh, in the physical domain, we got to watch out uh, because we're going to by having to observe some stability conditions, you know, as, since our computation is um, iterative, you know, there's uh, continued uh, computation in loops, and they can blow up. Okay, and we have to observe stability conditions for both accuracy and uh, for um, to keep the computation from blowing up. You know, on the basis of, of inadequately estimated derivatives. So that also stability conditions add to the cost of the computation. Okay, um, in the Fourier domain, uh, we're really pretty much stuck with um, a constant delta x. Okay, we we don't have much trouble. You know, all of our surveys, basically, all of our data sets have constant delta t. You know, at least within one data set, uh, we can we can we we have constant delta t. But if we're surveying along a um, uh, along a curved road. Or we have to, uh, you know, not install some receivers, or not, not do some source activations because we're too close to buildings, uh, or there's other problems. You know, we're in the middle. Of the a receiver would have to be in the middle of the street. Um, you know, we're going to end up with data sets that don't have constant delta x. Okay, and the physical domain um, routines are able to handle that. Okay, uh, whereas. Uh, uh, the Fourier domain routines, we have to make some sort of approximation or uh, in interpolation, which is always uh, non-optimal. And uh, and the big thing, you know, the Fourier domain uh, migrations are uh, rely on constant velocity, and we're going to start to allow velocity that varies in x and z with our physical domain migrations. So. Um, uh, we're going to we're going to develop some wave extrapolation equations that
that we'll use to downward continue. We use the same uh, uh, you know, migration as downward continuation plus imaging condition. Uh, so we're, we're modifying our downward continuation, but we're going to use the same old imaging condition. Okay. So uh, uh, what we need is we know the surface data, right? That's p at uh, z. And we have to have an expression for the, deriv the z derivative, the, the vertical derivative of the wave field. Okay, so p at z plus delta z is equal to p at z plus delta z times dp dz. Okay, we're going to derive that dp dz from the scalar wave equation to produce praxial equations. Okay, uh, using the transformation method, uh, and uh, and then we'll go to the uh, dispersion relation method. That'll be the 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 most useful one, and and. By now, it's much more traditional than the transformation method. So again, I'm going to I'm going to, you know, kind of skip through this transformation derivation of the parabolic wave equation. Um, you know, I wanted to have the whole thing here in the notes, but um, um, you know, it's really here just for historical purposes. So uh, it starts off with a uh, with a assumption of Velocity being a function of z, so it can vary as much as you want in z, but it uh, um, it doesn't vary in x. Okay, so that's uh, fairly useful, uh, and and we'll start off also with the ray parameter defined to be zero. Now, how is that going to be useful? Okay, um, you know because uh, if the ray parameter is always zero, then migration isn't going to do anything, right? Um, but uh, uh, you know, here's a uh, here's a very simple you know time shifting um, uh, Fourier domain um, um, representation of a vertically down going plane wave. Okay, uh, and and we can get started with that. All right, so here we have our our surface uh, data. Here's our downward continued data, and then you can see that we're shifting time by z over v, which is the way you know you ought to do it, right? So we want uh, p to not Quite be zero, still very small, but not quite zero. And this is kind of a mess here. Um, this is d squared q uh, dz squared. Okay, so uh, we're going to replace uh, the data by this q, uh, where the wave field itself, you know, varies quite slowly. The second derivative of the wave field, you know, p in z is is close to zero. Okay. So we replace that uh, that p wave field, the actual data, by this slowly varying wave field, and we substitute that solution into the scalar wave equation. All right, and then we bring our approximation back that uh, uh, the uh, uh, the z derivative. Well, here's a new approximation. Okay, q is supposed to vary only slowly, so the z the the second order derivative. Of of this q this weird q wave field uh, is uh, is going to go to zero. So that what that leaves is is basically a uh, uh, a wave equation. This is called a parabolic wave equation. It's got a z derivative of this wave field q, and and here's the time you know the two i omega over v. That's the time shift uh, you know that lets the wave field evolve in z. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't have a. It doesn't vary. Uh, in, in, its second derivative in z is zero. Only its first derivative has a is non-zero in z. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, we do allow d squared q dx squared. Okay, that's where the information comes that relates the uh, uh, the z evolution to the x evolution. Okay, so this is for you know small dip. You know very uh, almost flat layers. And uh, for, with this funny approximation, that the second z derivative is is about zero. Okay. Now, and so this we can solve for dq dz. So this is a wave extrapolator. Okay. Now, now it's it's kind of you know we don't have much fine fine tuning possible of our of our extrapolation here. You know we've gone all the way to a two term. Uh, wave equation and and with these all these assumptions we've made, you know we've gotten rid of a lot of terms, okay. And, and what if you know what if we want 
a 15 degree, you know, what if we have 15 degree diffs? See, maybe this would work for five degree diffs. But what if we want 15 degree diffs? So what if we want uh, 45 degree diffs? Okay, we've got no way of tuning this parabolic wave equation. Okay, so uh, we want more control over our over our extrapolation. So thus, uh, uh, Francis Muir uh, and uh, John Clairvaux came up with these dispersion relation derivations of praxial wave equations, and that's what really uh, allowed this um, allowed this field to advance. And it's how we'll we'll really do it. And uh, lab um, um, lab seven and uh, lab uh, uh, eight are uh, are based on this derivation. Okay. So uh, let's recall the dispersion relation that's obeyed by wave fields from the acoustic wave equation and uh, constant density. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to be saying that all the time. Uh, you know, we have kx squared plus kz squared is equal to omega squared over v squared. Okay. So what we want to do is solve for kz, okay, which would give us dpdz. I mean, that, that was Clairbaut and Muir's insight. All we have to do is solve for kz, right? And then we could inverse Fourier transform, and we got the, you know, the first derivative of the wave field in, in depth. And that's what we need for uh, for downward continuation for extrapolation. Uh, okay, so um, you know we can solve it for kz, and here we you know we're leaving the uncertainty in terms of whether the wave field's propagating up or down. You know we allow we're still allowing either way here, uh, and we pull out uh, kz equal to uh, plus or minus omega over v square root of the quantity one minus v squared kx squared over over omega squared, and then uh, you know ikz as a Fourier dual ddz. So we multiply both sides by um, i, and uh, we get ikz here, and that becomes dpdz. And then uh, what we have is plus or minus i omega over v uh, times uh, the square root of, of this same thing. You know times the uh, uh, wave field now. Now we can't further transform, um, you know, we can't transform ikx into dx. Uh, uh, we can't effectively do that without getting rid of that radical. Okay. Well, we could try, but it, it doesn't turn out to be very useful. So how do we get rid of the radical? Well, why don't we expand the square root in terms of a Taylor series, right? So here's a here's the setup for a Taylor series. Okay, so uh, f of x is f at a plus uh, one over one factorial, the the uh, derivative uh, uh, of uh, of f at a uh, with respect to x at uh, at uh, oh, times x minus a uh, plus one over two factorial, uh, the second derivative of f at a uh, with respect to x times x minus a squared. Okay, so you know, here's this gets definitely gets rid of the uh, of the uh, um, um, this Taylor series definitely gets rid of the radical. Okay, now I've got to move to notes twenty three. Okay, and we're on page uh, seventy nine. I think we're going to be. Oh dang. Um, Okay, well they're 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 there. Um, here we go. Let's see. So there's the uh, there's the Taylor series at the bottom of of page seventy eight, and now on seventy nine, you know what we've got is x equal to one minus v squared kx squared over omega squared, and a equals one. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, square root of x then. Is uh, one plus uh, x minus one over two minus x minus one squared over eight plus three forty eighths x minus one to the third power minus you know and and it, you know there's as many terms as you want there. So now you know I can uh, I can uh, then fill out with the definition of x. Okay, so we've got uh, the square root of the quantity one minus v squared kx squared over omega squared is equal to one minus v squared kx squared. 
over 2 omega squared plus v to the fourth power kx to the fourth power over 8 omega to the fourth power minus 3 v to the sixth power uh, times k sub x to the sixth power over 48 omega to the sixth power. Uh, and um, you know one way. Okay, so we'll we'll clear the uh, 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 some of the uh, omegas here, um, <clears throat> and uh, and we'll uh, we'll write it like this: v k z over omega is equal to plus or minus one minus v squared k x squared over two omega squared, and and so forth. Okay. So you know, depending on how many terms we keep, we can then uh, you know, multiply it by omega. We can multiply all sides by omega to the nth power, right? So for two terms, you know, which which gives you a fifteen degree equation. Okay, so watch this. Uh, here we go. Uh, we uh, multiply by uh, omega squared. Here we keep two terms. These two terms here, and we multiply by omega squared. So we on the left side we have v omega k z is equal to plus or minus. Uh, and the two terms become omega squared minus v squared over two times kx squared, and then you know here's the uh, the trick of of factoring one or minus one into um, uh, into uh, uh, into i omega or i kx right. So this is the tricky part, right? In here we want to we want to find um, we want to find those Fourier duals. So um, I'm factoring one into minus i and times i, and then we got omega and k z. Notice I've moved the v to the other side, uh, and uh, here I'm factoring omega squared into minus uh, minus i omega times minus i omega. Okay, and there's and that's over v, and then v over two. Okay. Uh, right, the the v squared goes away, uh, and then I have i k x squared. Okay, that that makes the minus sign that's there. So this bizarre factoring of minus one, right? That uh, that will um, um, uh, that gives us the the i omega, the i k z, uh, the i k x that we need. So now this is um, you know one time derivative and one z derivative. So that is d squared p dz dt. That's what that notation means. Okay, p sub z t means that we have one that we're taking one der z derivative of the wave field and one t derivative of the wave field. Okay, so it's a uh, first order derivative in two different directions, and then uh, plus or minus w minus one over v. This is d squared p dt squared, right? P sub t t. And then uh, plus v over two times this p uh, uh, sub x x means d squared p dx squared, right? P sub x is equal to dp dx. Okay, so just a shorthand notation for writing these these derivatives. Okay, so to keep the the three terms right, we would have to multiply, and that would that we would call a 45 degree equation. It's capable of getting diffs up to 45 degrees. We would have to multiply by omega to the fourth power, and and that would lead kx to the fourth. And our equation would have terms like uh, 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 p sub t t t t, right? D squared d to the fourth p over uh, d t to the fourth, right? And and also uh, uh, p sub x x x x. All right, and that's a that's a lot of differentiation. Okay, so can we get another order of accuracy without having to go to the fourth derivative? Like, just can we can we work the third derivative in there for a little more accuracy um, without having to go all the way to the fourth derivative? All right, because we're going to have to you know work out a finite difference scheme for. You know each of these derivatives, and the more derivatives there are, the the more complicated the finite difference scheme. Okay, and Francis Muir, uh, you know, working with Clairbout, found a, a way to do that. Okay, and it's called the Muir square root approximation. So we have, you know, what we're trying to approximate is this radical. You know, v k z over omega 
is equal to plus or minus um, the square root of the quantity 1 minus v squared kx squared over omega squared. Okay, now this looks kind of like this. vkz over omega is equal to pl plus or minus the square root of the quantity 1 minus capital X squared. That's what that's supposed to be. And capital X is equal to vkx over omega. Now, uh, so here's, here's the scheme. The nth order recursive approximation uh, is uh, s um, the square root. Okay, here's the square root we're trying to approximate. Okay, s is equal to um, uh, you know whatever's on the left here. The square root we're trying to approximate s capital S is equal to square root of one minus x squared. Okay, the nth order recursive approximation is one minus x squared divided by one plus the previous order approximation. Okay, now this is you know algebra algebraic recursion. Okay, so you take uh, you know to get the uh, the first order um, uh, the first order of approximation, you would have one minus x squared divided by the quantity one plus the zeroth order of recursion. Okay, and you got to start somewhere. So we got to say okay, the first the the zeroth order of recursion of approximation is s at at uh, zero is equal to one, right? So it would be uh, uh, the first one would be one minus uh, x squared divided by one plus one, okay, or two, otherwise known as two, right? Um, okay. Now we're going to assume this converge converges, and actually that's not really our that's not really important. You know whether it converges perfectly accurately or not, we're not too concerned. But if 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 it does if it does converge, we want to know that it converges to the right thing. It's got to converge to the square root, okay, the right square root. So as n goes to infinity, okay, if it converges, okay, then uh, s at n uh, becomes more like s at n minus one, right? If it's converging, then the the further you know iterations shouldn't change it very much. And then, and then we could call that uh, that solution s at infinity, and that should be uh, one minus x squared. Okay. So so you know infinity is the same whether it's infinity plus one or infinity or infinity minus one. So s at iteration inf at at recursion infinity is equal to one minus x squared over the quantity one plus s at infinity. Right, because s at infinity minus one is the same as s at infinity, assume, you know, assuming it converges. Okay, and um, and s at infinity. So so we clear this. We got s at infinity plus s at infinity squared is equal to one plus s at infinity minus x squared, big X squared. And uh, so then we can uh, uh, delete uh, uh, s at infinity from both sides. S at infinity squared. Is equal to one minus x squared, which means that s to infinity is uh, the square root of one minus x squared, which is what we wanted. So it does converge properly, okay? And and you'll investigate in uh, lab seven. You'll investigate, you know, how how accurate uh, you know these ver these various uh, iterations are. So now let's develop some some uh, uh, equations, okay? Uh, so uh, we have vkz over omega is equal to plus or minus s sub n, right? At whatever order we want, and uh, uh, we've got x equal to uh, vkx over omega. Okay, so s zero is one. That's going to be a five degree equation. That's we can, we're going to work that into a five degree equation. S one is one minus x squared over two. That's going to be a fifteen degree equation, and then um, s two. Is going to be one minus x squared over one plus one minus x squared over two, right? That's the previous one, just plugged in there, um, and then uh, we can clear that a little bit to being s two is one minus three quarters x squared over the quantity one minus one quarter x squared. That's going to be a forty-five degree equation, and I also show you later how to get a, a sixty-degree equation. That's just taking it the next the next level. So uh, uh, we have a forty-five degree three-term approximation. Okay, you know we clear the uh, denominator here, and that's going to end up with three terms. 
Uh, and what kind of diff uh, derivatives, what kind of differentials will the resulting wave equation require? All right, so we're going to have vkz over omega being approximated by plus or minus 1 minus 3 quarters v squared kx squared over omega squared over the quantity 1 minus 1 quarter v squared kx squared over omega squared. So we clear all the fractions, and we've got uh, vkz over omega minus 1 quarter vkz over omega times v squared kx squared over omega squared is equal to plus or minus the quantity 1 minus 3 quarters. And, and here, you know, I'm preserving the ability to flip plus or minus, but it always gets confusing because you know, if you decide on the minus one, you've got to propagate that inside, right? And that, that's the easiest place to make a mistake, at least I always do. So you've got 3 quarter v squared kx squared over omega squared. And you've got to multiply uh, all the terms by i omega to the third over v, right? And what we've got now is um, uh, i omega squared kx kz minus v squared over 4 i k z times kx squared is equal to plus or minus the quantity i omega to the third over v minus 3 v omega over 4 and there's got a, there's supposed to be an i in there that I forgot kx squared and now we got to factor everything into the Fourier duals right so this i factors into minus i um, squared and uh, i Right. We add the wave. We, we multiply all terms by the wave field p as well. So there's uh, you know there's there's two time derivatives. There's one z derivative. We got to keep it to one z derivative. Uh, and then uh, uh, and so that one becomes uh, minus p uh, z sub z t t. Right. That's d to the third p over d z d t squared. Right. Um, and then uh, uh, the next term, we factor i minus i into i k z and i k x squared, right? And so uh, that becomes v squared over four times p sub z x x, right? We got one z derivative, two x derivatives on the wave field, and then plus or minus, preserving that, um, and we factor the uh, i into uh, minus i to the third power. You can believe that over v. So we got one over v times p uh, sub t t t, right? Third time derivative, and then three quarters v, and we factor the i here into minus i times i squared. Okay, um, and so we end up with three quarters v uh, p sub uh, uh, sub x x t. We'll be out of here in a couple minutes. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then, uh, um, so here's a, a four-term equation, you know, where we've taken it to the next level, and we could call it a 45-degree equation. And what you'll find out is that, you know, the exact equation using the real square root in black here, you know, it's a semicircle with radius omega over v, and the uh, five degree is a flat line at, uh, you know, minus, uh, uh, you know, k. Uh, k z is equal to minus omega over v, right? Uh, and then uh, the 15 degree is this curve, right, which matches up to 15 degrees pretty well. The 45 degree is this red curve, which matches up to 45 degrees pretty well. So we've got, you know, we got more accuracy than two terms of the Taylor series, but only three derivatives, and a, and a good way to start. Okay, the complexity can depend, and and then of course the this angle here. Is the angle of wave propagation, which is of course is the angle of dip. Okay, that's what that that uh, little explanation was about. Okay, so uh, this is a good spot to uh, to end uh, because um, you know four terms is still a lot to finite difference. You know, you'll, you'll we'll, we'll start pretty soon in finite differencing, and you'll see that uh, it's a lot of work. So um, we got to see if there's a way to eliminate another term. Okay, since we're using, uh, you know, say upgoing waves, there may be a way to uh, eliminate another term, and that's what these retarded coordinates are for. All right.